Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And today we'll talk about homelessness in the San Francisco Bay Area with guests. John Ekstrom, CEO of Shelter Incorporated, Beth Stokes, Executive Director of Episcopal Community Services, and Sherry Wooldridge, Executive Director of St. Vincent de Paul Society. So thank you all for joining us. I'm so excited about talking about this really important topic because across the United States, homelessness is such a big issue and particularly in our urban centers. The San Francisco Bay Area is one of the wealthiest places in the world, yet we have this incredible homelessness issue. So John uh, Ekstrom, could you talk about how you see this, this issue first? And then we'll, we'll delve into the programs that each of you offer. But if we can just sort of go around the table, we'll start with you, John, we'll go to Beth and then Shari, just talk about how you see this overarching issue in the United States and in the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you, Mark, appreciate being here. I think it's a more complex issue than most people perceive. Homelessness has been with us, you know, for decades, literally. Uh, we've noticed it a lot in California in the last 20 or 30 years. I think a lot of that has to do uh, with our mental health system, uh, where we really didn't compensate uh, once a lot of the mental health facilities, state facilities were shut down. Uh, many of them were rightfully shut down. They weren't great places but we never came back uh, with a comprehensive way of dealing with mental health issues. I think the other piece too is uh, after redevelopment went away, the state currently has almost four, a need for 4 million new housing units. So we're caught in this catch 22. So while there's the chronic homeless folks that have been out there for a long time, uh, you know, a lot of them is what we see on the streets, but there are families and individuals that have been severely impacted uh, by the rise in rental costs and now, of course, with COVID. And Beth, how do you see the, the, the problem? Is it, is it uh, the, that same constellation that John laid out in terms of us, our failure to deal with the shuttering of mental health facilities and then the issue of, of, of uh, unaffordability, or are there other factors that you see, Beth? Yeah, I think there's a multitude of factors. I think uh, to dovetail into what John said, it is a complex issue. Yet I think that for each individual who is experiencing homelessness and unhoused, their story is unique. You know, everyone has kind of a unique experience in their lives to get to that place. Yet what's not unique with everyone who's unhoused is that they don't have housing you know, what they don't have is a home. And I think that to get to that, that place um, is a complex um, confluence of inequality, racial inequality, income inequality. I think it's also um, related to lack of investment, lack of investment in affordability, affordable housing in this country over the past 30 years, particularly in the state of California and the United States. Um, so that lack of investment you see up and down the state of California, when you don't invest in affordable housing and when you don't invest in communities, um, neighborhoods, um, this is the result. So I think the one thing that um, I know for sure ends homelessness is a house. And I think that folks are better able to deal with um, the complexities of behavioral health issues or um, in their efforts to recover from substance use um, they're able to address those issues or, or to get a job. I mean, let's not ignore the fact around employment, also health inequalities really have an impact on people's finances and their ability to stabilize. So it's a combination of many of those things, yet um, certainly uh, there's um, uh, across the table, the issue is about affordability and housing and lack of investment um, and inequality across um, the country and particularly in California. And Shari, St. Vincent de Paul uh, lived uh, 400 years ago, and he was dealing with these issues yeah. of, 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 of people living in poverty, people who were ill, people who were on the margins of society. Um, there are a lot, there's a lot that hasn't changed, and, and we're still dealing with it, aren't we? 
Yes, I mean, St. Vincent Paul in San Francisco has been an, in existence since 1833. So you can tell that it's a very old nonprofit, making sure we take care of the most vulnerable um, in our society. Uh, so we've been through a lot of major um, disasters that have happened in San Francisco through the earthquake and, and several things like that, the fire. So we've been taking care of um, those who are in need um, for those many years. So it's a, it's a lot. And so now we're in, and we don't necessarily do thrift stores. A lot of people think St. Vincent de Paul is about thrift stores. So we are doing services, social services, um, shelters. Um, we have a, a large shelter and a navigation center. We also um, provide services for survivors of domestic violence. So we're, we're sitting here at the, at the cusp of an election where uh, poverty has been accentuated by the pandemic because it has not fallen on people equally. We have mm -hmm. a even greater consciousness of the four centuries of, of racism in this country and our reckoning uh, here. We have disinvestment at the lower ends and tax breaks at the higher ends, which have been, um, uh, and we've got, we've got huge deficits. How do we move forward and, and try to heal some of these issues because, you know, there's only so much inequality that any society can take before people just get fed up and we collapse into viol violence and disorder. Uh, Sherry, how do you see us trying to create a consensus for support to solve these issues where that will inevitably mean that people who have more will have to give more, whether it's through taxes or through contributions in order to try and, and, and heal uh, these disparities and bring American society together. How do you see this? Well, um, you know, um, what Beth and John spoke about earlier, I mean, there's a, there needs to be a, a shift. Um, so right now there's housing in San Francisco but it's not necessarily affordable housing. It's not the right type of housing. So we need to shift how we look at building communities. So if we're looking at people or families who can afford housing and minimum wage is $11 or $15, what does that um, mean for a family if your housing is $800,000 or a million dollars up? So we have to shift and, and make sure that we have an equitable um, housing, um, income level, as well as businesses that can support everyone. Um, the ultra-rich, so there's nothing wrong. We live in a capitalist society. There's nothing wrong with making money. But at the same time, those who are making money need to think about um, who's, help, who's in their neighborhood, who's in their community. And that means um, shifting that mindset that housing is just not for the rich, but it's for everyone. Everyone deserves a place to um, call home. Doesn't it also speak to the identity of a city? Because if you have these world cities that become places that uh, only can house the wealthy, you create monocultures and you create a, a separation from the history of a place. Beth, um, when, when we take a look at the bell curve of wealth, right? At one end, we have the very wealthy and the other end, we have the very poor. And then the, the middle part is kind of what, we, what we've always designated as the middle class. Um, are, are you seeing an erosion of, of the capability of people at the lower ends to just be able to afford the day-to-day -day, uh, expenses as, as John pointed out? And, and how do we address that? Because we can't suddenly create uh, factory jobs in the middle of, of an urban center like uh, New York or uh, in the middle of a place like Chicago, right? How do we how do we deal with that disparity? Yeah, I mean, I think that all of us, um, I know that Shari and I uh, are both represented by unions in our organizations and, um, and work in a city that um, has made an effort to increase the minimum compensation for workers um, in San Francisco. Um, we're not there yet. It's certainly um, an effort, you know, but each year we have to commit to that as a community um, and in our negotiations, you know, with our union representatives. Um, I really think that a livable wage is, is necessary in San Francisco. Um, you know, it's something that we, um, I think, need to stop aspiring to and need to commit to. I think it's an issue of priorities. 
right? So what are we prioritizing as a society? What are we investing in? Are we investing in communities, particularly black and brown communities? Are we, are we investing in our essential workers who are putting their lives and their families' lives on the line each day in terms of um, you know, being there, uh, particularly for those that um, have ex lived experience of homelessness or who are experiencing homelessness and working you know, um, in our communities and working for our organization, Shari's organization, John's organization. And I just think that um, you know, uh, that type of uh, disparity really requires bold, you know, bold um, solutions and, and it requires leadership. Um, I know some communities are looking at universal, universal cash transfers and ways to help really commit to bringing people um, up to a, a wage or an income, let's call it an income, where they're able to um, survive and not just survive, but, but live um, and uh, you know, have stability so that they can um, you know, um, engage in, in some type of employment training or go to work, uh, be able to afford childcare. I mean, affordable childcare is essential, particularly for single moms who represent a large percentage of those folks that are unhoused, particularly black and brown women who are single moms, right? You know, so you're that pointing out something that's really important. I'm sorry for interrupting, but I want to draw attention to this, to this idea of the working poor, right. of, of being stacked. And I see, I see Sherry and John, you're, you're nodding. Yes. Um, this idea of the working poor, you know, previously homelessness, um, if, you, if you had a mental health issue, one can understand it was difficult to, to hold a job and to, to gain an income. Um, if you were in, in real impoverished circumstances where you didn't have any job skills, okay, one can, one can understand it. But now it looks like we're stacking layer upon layer of working poor people who are on the front lines in, in restaurants or, uh, or responders or teachers. Uh, John, are you seeing the same kind of stacking, uh, stacking up in which we have people who are working, working their, their butts off, holding two jobs, but they're just not able to, to get the housing that they need? Yeah. Yes, there's two primary drivers that we see. So one is in our capitalist society, uh, the whole concept of supply and demand. I spoke earlier about the shortage of housing. Right. So our housing costs in the Bay Area have gone up 88% since around 2010, so over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And our increase in average household income has only gone up 17%. So could you, you have that, that. Could you repeat that statistic, the juxtaposition there? Just certainly. So uh, housing costs have gone up 88%, while income has only gone up 17%. So if you yeah, look at I, the graph, right, mm -hmm. it's this gap that's been one of the biggest issues. And you add that in, you know, it's the supply and demand piece to it. It makes it very, very difficult. The other uh, factor is the minimum wage isn't enough. In Contra Costa County, where I am right now, it takes four and a half minimum wage jobs to afford an average two bedroom apartment. Four and a half and minimum wage jobs. Four and a half. And I was born in San Francisco. I went to school there. I've worked there, um, you know, and it's, it's out of reach for really most people today. And it just, it's spreading through the East Bay and beyond. So I think, you know, what we need to tackle is not only the lack of housing, but also find a way to get the minimum wage much, much higher uh, than it's been proposed both locally in you know, some of the cities and counties as well as at the state level. And then you have the issue of disparity in which the lower paid jobs are very often um, assigned to women versus men, right? You have the disparity of race, which is endemic, of education. And so what you end up having happen is a, com a combination, a confluence of factors end up creating this, this caste system, really, Shari, right? I mean, we have a caste system in the United States. And you see this generation upon generation upon generation. Now, if we're helping 
to house people on a temporary basis. We're providing shelter on an emergency basis. How do we lift people out of poverty on a sustained basis in order to change the calculus? And is there a role for, uh, for uh, some sort of legislative or, um, or uh, uh, legal framework, regulatory framework, um, that also has a consensus agreement so that we don't end up having these incredible political fights that are just that just create more heat than light. How do we how do we come how do we how do we deal with that from from a St. Vincent de Paul perspective? Well, I don't think it's necessarily um, uh, on St. Vincent de Paul or even nonprofits. Um, I think you said you know it's a political thing, so it's an investment. Um, in the city from the supervisors and the mayor. And I think the mayor has done a good job um, along with some supervisors of making sure there's some reinvestment into the African-American community in San Francisco. At one point, the population of African-Americans in San Francisco was at 13%. Um, maybe in the 70s, um, um, late 70s, early 80s. Now it's currently around four to 6%. But 37% of the homeless are African-American. So there's a big, huge um, need for reinvestment, reinvestment at the um, educational level, housing level, supporting so that there's home ownership. Um, otherwise, you're going to lose the entire um, African-American um, population because there is no way for, for them to catch up um, to how, where there's some good jobs with, um, when the ports were open, the shipyards, that's when a lot of the economic boom for the African American community was there. Um, and now those jobs are no longer there. Um, they have shifted um, to the tech jobs, um, stuff that people can do and work from home. So we need to reinvest in that kind of um, job training, workforce development, um, and support with um, housing. So could, could you make the case, if I'm a tech executive or I'm in, I'm in financial services, why do I care to have my taxes increase? Why do I care to contribute philanthropically to somebody who is not of my race? Why, why do I care, Sherry? Why do you care? I think um, any community needs to be diverse. Um, it's a richer community. I mean, this is what America was built upon is, you know, equality for all. And so how do you live in a monolithic type of environment and think that you are, you can contribute to the community, um, that you're um, a citizen of the world? Um, I know that a lot of people who have traveled and seen different parts of the world, they have a different mindset of those who stay in their own community and know only about their own world and their own family. I think in, in order for us to be a, a continuing to be a strong nation, a strong neighborhood, we need to have diversity and equality and equity and inclusion. Otherwise, we'll, we're gonna continue to have these major divides that are um, breaking the country right now. And Beth, how do you make that? I'm sorry, go ahead, Beth. Yeah, I just wanna say that it, it would be my hope that any CEO who's an executive of a for-profit corporation would have uh, diversity within their corporation, right? Uh, in their business, that's, that's the hope, the diversity of, um, of race, the diversity of the LGBTQ community, the diversity of, um, of uh, you know, a variety of, of individuals and in that, you know, I think that for um, uh, corporations, the um, investment has to be in community. It, it can't be, I think there was so much frustration uh, around, uh, you know, tax breaks and things like that. And, and it's complex and it is a discussion yet at the same time, um, you know, uh, large corporations in the Bay Area uh, because of the delta between wealth, because of the lack of investment in housing, really have to contribute into the community, into the, you know, not just their workers, but uh, in the communities in which they live. And it, it can't be, you know, it can no longer be a situation where 
um, their, their presence is taking away from a community or impacting a community in terms of housing and prices. There has to be, you know, I think a absolutely deliberate effort to be looking at that, you know, to ensure that that, that company um, is invested in looking at that and not doing damage to a community, not, you know, escalating, you know, rent prices and decreasing affordability. There's a responsibility to that, you know, uh, to be in that community in, in, from my perspective. And uh, I think there's a lot more work. Um, there's a lot of work being done, but I think there's a lot more work to be done by corporations um, across the country, but particularly in the Bay Area around the divide um, and the impact that they're having um, on communities. There has to be an acknowledgement of, of that damage. I think there's also a very selfish argument to be made. Um, if, if, if I'm a tech executive and I, don't really uh, live amongst people of diverse incomes, of diverse races, ethnicities, sensibilities. My customers are those people. They are buying my software, my hardware, my devices. If I am a banker, my customers, the people who are actually supporting my lifestyle are people who don't necessarily look like me or live like me, right? The more customers I have, the more we, we allow people to fall into poverty, the fewer customers I have, the less thriving my business becomes. Right. So, and, 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 and so if, 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 if not for the sake of values and a, and a question of diversity, even just self-interest would seem to uh, indicate that that's where we should go. We did uh, uh, two polls. One, we asked, um, whether this problem is solvable. 88% of people said that it was, mm -hmm. and 12% of people felt that homelessness is not solvable. Let's talk about the solutions that, that you each uh, see and start off with John. John, if you were going to select one great solution, and, and I know that there are a number of different programs that you offer, John, so I'm just gonna restrict you to one because I wanna give Sherry and Beth uh, a, a bite at this apple as well. But if you were to select one thing, what is the thing that you would you would look at? I, I can't choose just one. I'm sorry, so, <laughs> but I'll be but I'll be quick. So at Shelter Inc., we're actually going to have our 34th anniversary on November 17th. So we've been around a long time. Uh, we actually operate in three counties now: uh, Contra Costa, Solano, and Sacramento. Uh, so it goes back to something Beth said earlier. There's a, a widespread of needs for people who are homeless. And it's really, you have to treat each individual and mm -hmm. let them go down their own path. There isn't one single solution. Mm -hmm. So in our world, we have five shelters across the three counties. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of units of permanent supportive housing as well as rapid rehousing. So the difference is permanent supportive housing is uh, people that have mental or physical disabilities and they get subsidies. In rapid rehousing, we provide a subsidy for a limited period of time going forward. And more important to today where we are is our prevention program. So we've been fortunate in a couple of the counties where we have received a fair amount of money from both foundations as well as city and county governments to be able to provide those uh, families who have been severely financially impacted by the pandemic to help them maintain their housing over time. So well, I really think there needs to be a variety of solutions out there because everybody starts you know, from their own unique place. So your point is to meet people where they are first exactly. and each individual. Sherry, how do you see it? Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, so uh, there's different reasons why people are homeless. I mean, we even have uh, in our shelters, we even have um, people that are working that are homeless because they right. can't afford um, a place of their own. And I think one of the things we're known for is making sure that we treat our homeless, we call them guests as opposed to clients or, or homeless. Right. Um, those who are unhoused are our guests. And we make sure we treat everyone with dignity and respect so that they still have that um, ability to do what they need to do. Um, and so we're working on problem solving with all our guests. You know, what do you need? What are you missing? How do we help you? How do we refer you um, 
to an organization, to income, whatever you need. So I think that you have to um, treat everyone based on that one-on-one -on -one, um, connection um, to, to decide on what they need to do to end their homelessness. And Beth, uh, I take it that you also believe that we have to look at the individual, but let's also talk about organizing because you also have to create programs that cross individuals. So as you create programs, where, where do you emphasize the first line of defense? Yeah, I mean, I think I, one of the things that's a great question, I think that um, I will go back to the other question for a moment. And in terms of, um, I, on the macro scale, I, I do think that uh, a piece of it that often gets out of, left out of these, these um, conversations is um, displacement in communities, particularly in poor communities or communities um, uh, that are um, not invested in. And so I think that we have to really look at displacement and we have to look at prevention. We have to really pay attention to folks falling into homelessness. Um, we're often in reaction mode in terms of line of defense to get to your question. Um, whereas um, I think there has to be a lot of work done to ensure that folks that are older, you know, um, who, you know, should not be, you know, falling into homelessness. Um, you know, the idea of, oh, we're gonna, you know, you know, work with someone who's 75 and be able to um, get them into job training program and, and other tools in the toolkit that folks utilize um, to try and stabilize someone's income and get them into housing and stabilize in housing. Um, that, that's not the solution. And so I think that there's a multitude of things we have to look at as a community, as a society. And I think we have to, we have to really stop folks from being displaced to, care, uh, to Shari's point from their community. We have to prevent people from falling into homelessness in the first place. So we're not always in reaction mode that we're getting ahead of it. Um, we have to go upstream and look at the systems uh, the, the folks that are impacted by systems the most, systems like the criminal justice system. And when you ask me about like what, you know, what is that front line of defense? For me, it's, it's really kind of looking at um, housing and housing affordability. And I go back to that and I will continue to go back to that because I think that for many folks, particularly when you look at folks coming out of the criminal justice system who walk outside of the door and into homelessness, it's inexcusable. Right, folks need to walk out of the door and into a home, right, to give them um, an opportunity to stabilize their lives. And I think that that's what we can um, and should be focused on. One, in trying our very best to ensure people do not become homeless in the first place. And then on the other side of that, really ensuring that we have a healthy supply of affordable housing and supportive housing, uh, making that distinction that John made that this is about you know, for folks that are chronically homeless that have very complex issues, that we have deeply affordable, um, supportive housing um, that has, they have a lease in their name and they have services on site um, so that they can um, stabilize um, and not be on the street, you know, for decades, because we see that. Um, there, that is a, there is a fallacy um, that is, a, that although it is a fallacy, it's a valid concern that we create sustainable codependence. Um, the fallacy is, is that nobody wants to be sustainably codependent. People want to figure out a way to be independent. Um, we asked a, 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 in, a, in a poll, what are the most important things we can do to reduce homelessness? And, and the, the results are really interesting. The highest responses were to increase early intervention programs, provide more supportive services, which is a flavor of that, integrate affordable housing to all, into all kinds of neighborhoods so that uh, it's spread out uh, in, in regions as opposed to clustered and provide more temporary shelters so to get on your feet. So it's a combination of, of affordability and, um, and quick interventions to prevent people from falling into homelessness. The uh, least uh, votes were received by a, sort of the punitive approach. And then we also took a poll as to how we, who's responsible for this. And that, that was also very interesting. Um, individuals got 6%, businesses 3%, nonprofits got 12%. 72% felt that government has a role. So let's talk a little bit about this as, as we close and, and we'll take the reverse um, order and we'll, we'll uh, talk, uh, uh, st we'll start with Sherry and then Beth and then 
John uh, Ekstrom. Um, as you look at government and government's role, mm -hmm. um, do you believe that government has the primary role? And how do we deal with the fact that every time government gets involved, we end up with these massive societal arguments in which we have you know, people dividing into camps and saying no government, bad government or whatever. How do we now take an approach that incorporates these various concerns and ends up with more light than he generated, Sherry? Well, for me, the government um, is the people the people in the, in the neighborhood. So yes, I mean, we have government contracts and, and that's what um, sustains us and helps us provide services. But also what's the priority that the people it, from the government say, do we want shelters in our neighborhoods? Do we want homeless on the street? So somebody has to take that mantle and say, we have to get people off the street. What's the priority? So that's where your supervisors, your mayors, your councilmen, your governors come in to say, yes, we, we have this, this problem um, and it needs to be solved. And in partnership with nonprofits or other businesses and community leaders, we're taking care of our community. So the government, we pay our taxes. And that's where our tax dollars go to making sure that our communities are, are balanced. Um, so I think everyone ha has a part. So the government is the larger part, but at the same time, we also have community leaders and nonprofits. So it's a shared responsibility. So I, I love this answer. So there, there are people who really need help. The people who have uh, mental health challenges, and we've just received a number of questions focused on how do we address that? And what you're saying is that that's really a communal responsibility. In our families, if we have a family member who needs that type of help, the family gathers together and figures it out. And we are the family for those people in, in America who have those kinds of challenges. I think it's a, it's, it's a wonderful point. Uh, Beth, uh, what is, what is your, uh, your view of how uh, government should function? And is it really reserved for those people um, who have those kinds of, uh, of issues? Or is there also a framework that government should set up that allows others actors to co to coordinate and collaborate effectively. Yeah, I think that yeah, uh, the broader question: Does government um, have a responsibility? Absolutely, without question. Um, I think that government um, does have a responsibility in terms of providing the safety net for people not to fall through um, and um, be on the street. I think that um, there is a responsibility there. I think government. Um, you know, participates in taxing its citizens and has a responsibility to invest in communities and invest in housing. Um, the fund, the, the, the revenue that comes into communities, it's nothing that an individual would, would be able to provide or for the most part, even a corporation or a foundation for that matter. And so, um, but we need everyone to participate in the solution. And um, to Shari's point, um, you know, there, there are, um, you know, efforts in communities where they are bringing public and private partnerships to the table. One recently I was in um, or aware of and involved in uh, was with a, the state um, leveraging, you know, 15 million of their own funds and 15 million of, uh, you know, philanthropy funds from foundations to really work on the issue of addressing um, the COVID outbreak in the prison population and exits into, into housing. And so um, those are the type of efforts like Tipping Point and the San Francisco Housing Accelerator Fund and how we all partner together to really kind of leverage resources because I, I think that that's essential. Mm -hmm. I think it's essential that mm -hmm. a community member participate in elections and you know, participate in becoming an elected official so that they have a voice and can represent um, their constituents and community. We're all part of the solution, but we, it, it, takes a, a, it takes a political will. Um, it takes a, um, it takes bold, I think, decisions at that, this time and bold leadership if we're going to really kind of close the divide and, and homelessness, which I absolutely believe is possible um, and agree with the poll. Um, so I think that it's, um, it's all of us. It's, it's not one person, but it does, take, it does take an entire community. It takes a system of care working together 
Um, and I think in government, that's often hard to do. Um, so that's the, that's the, you know, some of the work that's in front of us. And it takes a regional approach. Let me just say this too, um, that I do think that uh, we have to work more regionally um, in California and in other states um, to really address the issue of homelessness. So we're coming to the end of our time. John, I'm gonna give you the last word. We hear a lot about income redistribution. And the, the question that I have is that uh, we take money from citizens and employ it for the common defense of the nation. Is part of what we need to do to strengthen America to deal with poverty so that we take capability that is on the sidelines that can't actually be productively invested in strengthening the country and create a circumstance where people can work, can live, can contribute, and thereby make America stronger, which would justify my taxes being spent for that. Is, is that really part of it? Are we defending the nation and strengthening the nation through these types of programs? I believe we are. Uh, Beth mentioned, you know, the safety net, and I'd like to talk about that just for a second. So when Ronald Reagan, I'm old enough to remember listening to him on the TV when, <laughs> we won't talk about my age, uh, shutting down the mental health hospitals, he yeah. said, well, families and churches will take care of them. So back in the 1800s, that was a true statement. People lived in small towns. The center of the town was the church. Everybody went. Multiple generations of families lived there. Everybody knew you each have, other. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, had, you had that ingrained safety net. You know, I have family all over the world, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Church is much less visited these days uh, compared to what it was, you know, 100, 200 years ago. So that's my comments on that. Um, back to the, the income inequality piece. Uh, we've seen this with the disappearing middle class over the last 20, 30 years, right? Or as John Maynard Keynes said, you know, last century, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. And his prediction from the early 20th century is happening. And that's what we're seeing. So uh, how we redistribute that wealth, you know, the government typically does it through tax programs. And Beth is correct in saying that this is a regional issue. I'll call your attention. I don't know if you can see this, but this was a Bay Area Council report that McKinsey did. Mm -hmm. And their number one finding was this is a regional issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we see is our funding for our nonprofits are very siloed. So you get dollars for one specific thing. And what us as nonprofits have to do is pull those funds together and braid them to create an effective program, right? So, and that's, I think, part of the difficulty. Sherry mentioned, uh, you know, the system of care that we have. We have people in crisis with uh, oftentimes not all the abilities in order to be able to navigate a very complex system of care. So part of our approach is, uh, and our mission is self-sufficiency. So we provide as many wraparound services as we can, either through our own programs and staff or by collaborating with lots of other agencies, because it takes all those resources to help people get onto that path of self-sufficiency. I think another term for income redistribution is investment in, uh, in solving certain problems. We're a problem solving nation. We've always been strongest when we've had two things going for us. One is engaging our diverse communities in problem solving, whether it's on the business side, on the social civic society side, on the government side. When we are focused on problem solving instead of arguing about things, we are strong. And the other, the other piece is that when we have a strong middle class, we see middle class under threat, we see us arguing instead of solving. Let's adjust ourselves. Let's do what we can for ourselves and with our friends, come together and, and change America in the way that we would envision the country being stronger. I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for being with us. That's the nonprofit report for today. Thank you so much, uh, John uh, Ekstrom, uh, the CEO of Shelter Incorporated, 
uh, Beth Stokes, uh, Executive Director of Episcopal Community Services, and Sherry Wooldridge, the Executive Director of St. Vincent de Paul Society. Thank you so much for your work. Attendees, thank you for coming and stay safe, mask up.